Hello, hello, my friends, and welcome back to episode 29 of The Kindness Rebellion. In this episode, I had the honor and privilege of speaking with Darren Perry, the former councilman and chairman of the Northwestern Band of Shoshone Nation. Uh, he is also the author of The Bear River Massacre, A Shoshone History, and he is an educator and a fierce advocate for indigenous well-being as well as the well-being of our planet. Uh, this was so amazing to have this opportunity. I, I really really valued this conversation with Darren. I met him after the uh, rally to save the Great Salt Lake when he gave a, a speech there about the ways that we can all band together to advocate for this earth and remember our, our common humanity and how we are nature and how water is life. Man, this I was so, so happy to have this conversation with him. I do want to make a small disclaimer that the audio, uh, we had some technical difficulties with it. So my good friend Todd Tran was able to clean it up for me a little bit, but um, it, it's, it's still not the, the quality that I would have liked. However, that does not change the quality of the conversation. It was so, so amazing. And I'm really happy to share it with you. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into the episode. And thank you so much for listening. This is a podcast about rejecting tyranny and oppression by cultivating both systemic and individual change. I believe the only way to create this kind of monumental change is to inspire understanding, love and kindness. From there, we can work to embody these essential values in our cultural systems and in our individual lives. My hope is that by effectively communicating with anyone and everyone, we can establish a shared vision for humanity and explore new ways of living to build a better world for all of us. I'm your host, Nathan Jones, and this is The Kindness Rebellion. Darren. Thank you so much for coming on to the Kindness Rebellion. This is uh, this is honestly an honor for me. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to come out here and uh, talk to me about uh, your culture and uh, really just all of the things going on in the world, especially here in Utah with uh, the Great Salt Lake. This is uh, this is really amazing. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I never turned down an opportunity to talk about something so important to me. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Of course. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and get started with uh, maybe just a little bit of your background, if you could. Um, just kind of tell us uh, kind of, I guess, your credentials, if you will, um, or and then just kind of like your experience and what you've uh, what you've been seeing in the world. Well, I grew up in Davis County. Uh, luckily, I grew up in Syracuse. Mm. And a lot of people don't know the me the big deal with Syracuse is in order to go to Antelope Island on the Great Salt Lake, you drive through my town. So mm. I grew up in that town and as as young boys and teenagers, we spent a lot of time out on Antelope Island causing trouble probably. <laughs> so, but I remember being out there in years that you couldn't go out there because the water was so high. It went over the road and washed out the road. And then years like we're experiencing now, so. But my dad was a school teacher when I was younger. I wanted to be a school teacher, but come from a family of school teachers. Attended the University of Utah and uh, Weber State University and got my teaching degree, wanted to be a teacher. And, and ironically, never taught a day in the public school system <laughs> and, and went down a different path. But as a friend reminded me the other day, I said, you know, I haven't really been a teacher. And they go, really? That's all, that's all you do yeah. is teach. And I said, I know, but in a public school setting, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, that was never who I was. And, you know, I had a family, uh, did the whole Mormon thing and, and got married, had a family, seven kids and uh, love all of them. But they all, they're all educated. They all got their college degrees. And so uh, proud of them for doing that. But, you know, when I was younger, and what really got me on this journey is uh, my parents both worked and I was the oldest one in the family. They would ship me off to my grandmother's house. Mm. Well, my grandmother was made Tim Bimboo Perry. Uh, she was a, a bad A. She was, <laughs> she was our tribal historian. She was our knowledge keeper for the Shoshone Nation and, and she'd been to boarding school she continued her education and got her degree. And then she began writing down all of that oral history that she'd heard from her elders. Mm -hmm. 
And so because of her, I mean, when you're a kid, you don't know the really realize the importance of who she was. But uh, so that really shaped me, sitting at her feet, hearing the stories about uh, how the bald eagle became bald mm -hmm. and stories about our creation story in the Great Salt Lake and Antelope Island and, and what she would always refer to as our non-human kinfolk. Mm -hmm. You know, her saying that to me. So I grew up looking at a plant different than other kids would look at a plant. Yeah. They were kin. They were a relative. And so I'm so grateful that I grew up with that perspective. And, uh, you know, here I am today, the, uh, the former chairman of the Shoshone Nation. I stepped down three years ago to run for Congress. Mm. So I thought we could make a difference on the national level with some of this indigenous perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I uh, wasn't successful. I, apparently the wrong party if you're in Utah. <laughs> so, uh, but it gave, what it did though, is it introduced me to a lot of different people. Mm. I probably wouldn't have never gotten to meet uh, by running for Congress. And it stretched me personally mm -hmm. to learn more things and, and to, you know, build bridges of understanding between people that really don't see eye to eye. And, mm -hmm. and if you you want to know what that's like, just start pol talking politics yeah. with somebody <laughs> in our communities. And you'll find out very quickly uh, what that bridge building and peacekeeping and peacemaking and, and love looks like, because mm -hmm. uh, it can go south really quickly. Yeah. If you let it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's kind of who I am. And how I got on this journey, I get to speak so often about the environment and history and hard history and, mm -hmm. and other things. And I feel really grateful for that uh, opportunities that even you're giving me today. So thank <laughs> yeah, you. Thank you. That's really, it's a, thank you for kind of sharing that background with us and, and just kind of giving us that, uh, that, that little biopic. Um, I think one of the things that I really resonated with right off the bat is just the idea of how you were trying to do that bridge building um, in your bid for Congress. Um, you know, one of the things I really try to focus on uh, in this podcast is uh, building connection through understanding love and kindness. And so that was, uh, I really like that you phrased it that way. And I, I kind of wanted to, one of the big questions that I wanted to uh, get at, and I think we'll just dive in since you mentioned your bid for Congress, is, um, is how much we, like you think that the legislative uh, process can really make the changes that we're looking for? Because obviously you thought it could make a difference since you um, ran for Congress. I'm curious to see, uh, kind of understand your perspective on that a little bit more now. Yeah, and, and let me talk more specifically about what maybe the government and other things can do locally. Mm. Because I ran for U.S. Congress. And, oh, okay. Uh, that's a whole different animal. And I think you get a lot less done as a U.S. congressman mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. than what our lawmakers here can do. Mm -hmm. And so, but I spent probably 20 days mm -hmm. of the 45 at the legislature this year and advocating for Indian child welfare, uh, but mostly about the Great Salt Lake. And what I find is it's interesting. We had the worst, and don't get me wrong, the snowpack is a blessing beyond blessing, mm -hmm. but it was actually the worst thing that could happen for our legislators. Yeah. Just because they think, oh, no problem. We've got all the water we need. Yeah. And in re and so, look, I, I have hope that they'll do the right thing and make correct decisions. Uh, they're moving you know, they're taking steps towards changing policies and and they're throwing money at the problem, mm -hmm. uh, not enough. Yeah. And they're taking what I consider baby steps mm -hmm. to a problem that actually is going to require leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. And yes, this one year of water gave us a reprieve, but there's one thing that's in the back of everybody's mind and and it's climate change. Mm -hmm. And what has that done to our weather cycles? I mean, are we going to have three more years of the water we've got today, or is next year going to be snowless or, mm -hmm. you know, almost that? And it's something that we really can't predict. Mm -hmm. So the problem's not going away. 
this water year has given us a chance to catch our breath and, and make a plan. And, you know, the legislature has done some things. They're going to have to do a lot more to solve the problem, though. Mm. And I, I think they will. I have high hopes that they will. But they will only make those decisions as they are almost forced to. Mm. I wish they were more proactive in saying, good, we've got a good water year, but let's make changes now. Mm -hmm. As if we didn't get hardly any water. That's the way we need to look at it. Yeah. And make those changes now, and which will be painful to those, you know, people that have those water shares. Mm. Our, our, I think our water laws are archaic. I think they need to be completely redone. I live in a section of the Cache Valley down in the south end, and all my neighbors are alfalfa farmers. Every one of them, they're ranchers and farmers. And look, I don't want to take their water away, and they don't want me to take it away. Yeah. But certainly, you know, the law of the land used to be, they called it first in time, first in right. Mm. Well, that's true unless you were a Native American. Ooh, yeah. and, and so that didn't apply to them because they would have always been first in time. Yeah. But they were never first in right. So I just think we need to start making policies today that will uh, change our system completely and how we'll allocate water. Water was always the Colorado River Compact that was signed 100 years ago. They allotted twice as much water than was ever in the system. And so when you start doing things like that and then add millions of more people into the equation, you're going to have problems. And so I have high hopes for the legislature. Most of those guys are my friends. We don't agree on everything politically. Mm -hmm. And I think they'll make the right decision. But I think they'll make it only as they're forced to make it. Gotcha. And uh, I hope I'm wrong on that front. But... Uh, they can point to some things that they've done recently, but I think it's just, you know, tiny steps towards a huge problem that we're going to have in the future. Mm -hmm. So it's really going to be on a lot of us as, uh, you know, as, as their constituents to really kind of push them and make them see the problem, or are you saying it may be reactive in the end? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's going to be reactive. Mm -hmm. However, you brought up a good point. Um, I think there's there's roles that each one of us can play. And you know, when I, when I look at the lake and look at some of these groups that have formed, Save the Great Salt Lake, Friends of the Great Salt Lake, the Great Salt Lake Collaborative. You know, at first I thought, oh my goodness, there's all these different groups advocating for the lake. Is the message going to get lost mm -hmm. on lawmakers and others because we have all these competing groups? It's like diluted. Really, yeah, advocating for the same thing. But as I've gotten to know the players in each group, and man, they're 20 somethings. They're these young, vibrant kids that, uh, like the youth at Standing Rock, they're not going to take it. And mm. they're not going to sit back and watch their future because we're talking about their future and their kids' future. And they're not willing to sit back and wait for the legislature to take tiny steps. Mm. And I love that. I, that's what gives me hope is to see the younger generations saying, mm -mm, we're not gonna wait for you to have to do it. We're going to help you by pushing that message along. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's room at the table for activists of all kinds, because I think they're really a backstop to, to really make the legislature do the right thing. Uh, because they're gonna be there. They're gonna be in their ear constantly. Mm -hmm. They're not going away. And so, to me, I love seeing that, and I love to see that activism. And who knows? They might they might start changing policy that will really make big big steps here in the future. I just don't know if they're capable right now of doing yeah. that. Yeah, it's. I think that was something that it was a little disheartening for me when I kind of uh, when I went to that that rally for uh, Save the Great Salt Lake back in January. That was my first rally I ever been to. And I was a little disheartened because I left that with this feeling of like, oh, all we have, all we really can do, it feels like, is to just yell at our legislatures, uh, legislators as much as possible. Um, but I, I think that, and kind of in 
talks with uh, you and, and some other activists, it's really like it's really about educating them and making uh, making them see how much of a problem this is because they're just inundated with all sorts of problems all, all the time. Yeah, they they have a lot on their plate. That's just not just water. I mm-hmm. mean, if water was the only thing, but they have other things to worry about too. Water should probably be like one of the primary ones, right? So as a Native American, water was life. Yeah. We were hunters and gatherers and we traveled in this cyclical pattern. We always stopped and camped where there was water mm-hmm. because you, you could go days without food. Mm-hmm. But in that environment of that climate, that harshness of climate, you couldn't go more than a day or two without water. Mm-hmm. So water is life. And so, yeah, if, if there's a problem facing the legislature, that needs to be problem number one. Yeah. And it's going to make or break us, really, uh, with the, what we do in the next decade, for mm-hmm. sure. It's really interesting that, I don't know, it wasn't really until I started participating more in, like, the dialogue around the Great Salt Lake that I actually, like, it really started to hit me how much water is life, even though I literally need it every day to exist. But it like, and there was some other talks and discussions there about, you know, like the interconnectedness of everything and, and how water is like a, a huge piece of that. And um, part of like, I'm honestly like uh, everybody here in Springville is a little nervous because the Hobble Creek is flooding like crazy because of all that snowpack. But I I love seeing like all of the water. It's, yeah. it's been like really important. And I think that the it's interesting how just that reframing of that perspective of like water is life we need to prioritize it um it, it it's weird that it took me so long to like reshift and, and shift that perspective that way and it kind of made me um question uh, or at least want to ask uh, one of the bigger another big question is just like that that kind of those indigenous perspectives that really um what what indigenous perspectives do you think we all need to uh take in and understand and uh, and what kind of wisdom should we be uh you know accepting and learning from and utilizing to make the changes that we need to make in the world well that's a big question yeah and so we can talk <laughs> days about that but i mean i think the one thing i love about indigenous communities and is land is always used as pedagogy So land was used as a way to teach. Mm. Everything was centered around the environment. Mm. We taught our children, uh, all the principles we taught our children were through land, through hands-on experiences, talking about our uh, non-human kinfolk, Mm -hmm. which is everything that surrounds us. Realizing that everything in our world is connected. So you have a world of We live in a world of Western values that value uh, ownership, extraction, depletion. The land is there for, uh, to make a dollar. Mm -hmm. It's available for uh, development. And that's how I was taught. Our school systems are taught to perpetuate this capitalistic ideal. Mm -hmm. And that is the resources that we have at our fingertips are available for you to make a dollar on it. To, to, to Native American people, though, that was never the idea. The land was given to us by our creator to be carefully and lovingly maintained. Mm-hmm. And so it's a completely different way we view the environment and our stewardship. A lot of people think that Native Americans own the land. I've never talked to one Native American that ever felt like they owned the land. They were stewards Mm -hmm. given by, the land was given to the the natives as stewards over a certain piece of land to take care of it and to make sure that uh, the earth would continue to yield year after year, but only when our steps are light and our hearts are right. Mm -hmm. And so that indigenous wisdom is really uh, it's what's going to save us at the end of the day. Because look, uh, we have science this problem to death. We live in the second driest state in the country. We keep bringing millions and millions of people here along the Wasatch Front. The only way we can make that happen is to engineer more water 
out of the limited resources of water that we have. And so we have done scientifically engineering enough water for everybody to live comfortably. And, and like you said earlier, we don't think about the water as being life because it's always there. Mm -hmm. You turn on the tap and it's there. It's clean. You don't have to worry about getting sick. There's a lot of countries that that's not quite the case. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a, a, a resource that is that even I, as an indigenous man, take for granted that it's always going to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, you tend to not take care of it so much. Yeah. And so, but to native peoples, they realize that everything in the environment was connected. And if something was done here, it affected something over here. And you couldn't get away from that. So protecting the watershed meant there would be more animal life for you to hunt and be more plant life for you to gather. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in their, their worldview of things is it all matters. You can't take one thing for granted over another and, and protecting that water source was always top priority because that gave life to everything else. I don't think native people ever took the water for granted mm -hmm. because as they're on this cyclical hunting and gathering cycle, they weren't quite sure where they were going to get the next water. Uh, what if some, there might've been a water source there one year, but it might not be there the next year. And so they were keenly aware of where that water source would come from. And so that indigenous perspective is, is so important because we start to interject in this science, in a world of science and manufacturing more water, uh, indigenous perspectives teach us that, uh, one, we all have obligations mm -hmm. to the community, to the community as a whole and to the past and present and future. And the other one is that, and I love to say this, and I came up with it a while ago, but I say that all the science in the world won't make up for our selfish behaviors. Mm -hmm. And so the answer, what I see from the legislature and others is to tackle the problem, we need more science. Hmm. Well, we've scienced this problem to death. And uh, for me, it's we don't need more science. We need to add values to the science. We need to uh, interject this indigenous way of thought that really teaches people uh, in a way that changes your heart. When you look at the environment in a way and you look at the plants you're destroying as kin, then then there's something and should trigger inside you that uh, that's a resource that is we're destroying a resource that is as important as our relationships with each other. And I think that's when you can start making this change. But we have to change heart and not learn with our minds so much because don't we all know what to do with sci I mean, climate change? The answers are in front of us in every publication you want, ever want to read. We know what to do, but we fail to do it. We fail to do it because we haven't uh, added values to the science. Mm -hmm. And until we start adding those values to the science, we're really going to struggle. We can't have one or the other. That collaboration between indigenous values and ways of looking at the world needs to be combined with cutting edge science to make a difference. And I think that collaboration is what's going to be needed. Robin Wall Kimmer in her books, Braiding Sweetgrass, it's my Bible. She talks about uh, relationships and collaboration and how you can't braid sweet grass alone. Hmm. It takes two and it takes somebody to collaborate with you to do it. And I think that's what's going to need to take place here in the future to save our lake. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I, there's so many different points I want to I touch on there, but I like, I think one of the, the first things that was really that idea that we're trying to science the problem to death. And like, uh, it's funny because we, I think you're right where we really do like put science on a pedestal and like say like, oh, this is gonna solve all our problems. But then despite having all of this research, all of these facts, we're still not 
doing anything. And so uh, I like what you said about adding values to to that science. And it's I think what that ends up doing is just helps us prioritize like what what things do we actually want to use science for? Because right now it's really just for you know getting the newest iPhone that's no different than the last one kind of thing, rather than um, actually implementing more efficient technologies and systems um, to actually fight climate change and. Uh, it was there's uh, when we went up to Antelope Island where you and Nan Seymour had that uh, that kind of Q and A up mm-hmm. there. Yeah. There was something you mentioned about how you know all the facts in the world just doesn't really change anyone's um, perspective. It's more about uh, like creating a story with that. Um, and I, I wonder if that's kind of what what you're referring to in terms of like adding values to these, to the science, to these facts. Yeah, it is. There was a scientist, a really famous scientist, and I love his quote. He said, he said, as a scientist, I thought that with 30 good years of science, we could solve this climate change crisis. And then he said this, he said, but I was wrong. He said, the top environmental problems that we face today are selfishness, apathy, and greed. Wow. And we scientists don't know how to fix that. And then he talks about a spiritual rejuvenation Mm -hmm. of interjecting these value systems into the science. Then you have a chance. And, you know, I I look at things and I drive a, I don't drive it a lot because it eats my gas too much, but I have a Dodge 2500 Ram diesel pickup truck that pulls my horse trailer. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, my mind is telling me, you shouldn't be owning that because, you know, what I've been talking about in the environment and and being better and more sustainable, that's not being that. Mm -hmm. So we all have these selfish behaviors that prompt us into doing things. But it's only when... And in my mind, I know, okay, I can give you 10 reasons that we can do individually to combat climate change. Mm -hmm. You know, here's this one, here's this one. Don't buy plastic bottles. I mean, there's a million things that our mind knows to not do, but we still don't do them. Mm -hmm. And it's because of that, you know, we, we haven't changed our perception and we haven't injected those values I don't value those things enough to want to make a change yet. Mm. And what's going to make me do that? Uh, I sat in on a young lady's, uh, she was getting her PhD uh, yesterday at Utah State University, and it was her defense. And she'd been working with elders from the Blackfoot Nation in Canada. And she had me in tears the whole time because she talked about the value systems that Native Americans and how they looked at land uh, completely different than how we view land. And um, land was as important as anything else. And the plants and rocks and water have spirits. And we need to treat them in a spiritual way. And so, you know, when you start looking at things that way in your environment and truly believing that and not just saying it, you'll treat it different. And you won't do those things that harm that thing. So... Mm. Uh, I think that's what's needed and because I think when you assume that scientific knowledge is superior in any way to indigenous wisdom, you make collaboration impossible. Mm. And I think it's that collaboration that's going to really be needed, but it's going to change the world. Yeah. And so I, we're going to get there and I have great hope that we'll get there. I'm always an optimist when it comes to this stuff. But uh, we might suffer a little bit in in the meantime. Yeah. I I was just thinking there that, you know, when when you said, like, what is it really going to take to make us, like, start doing these things that um, we know we probably should do or should not do um, to actually fix the climate? And really what I kind of keep thinking about is, like, well, we need... We need like systemic change. We need uh, we need a different type of motivator to to do these things rather than just like shaming individuals and saying you're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. It's more like what can we all do together? It's building that collaboration like you're talking about. Yeah, and I love that idea. And let me give you two examples. One hundred years ago, they signed the uh, Colorado River Compact at Bishop's Lodge uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. 
the seven states that call the Colorado River Basin home, that have the rights to this river, got together. Herbert Hoover was the chair, and they signed this compact to divide up the Colorado River Compact. That's who was in the meeting. That's who's met there for a week. And I asked the question, who wasn't there? It was the 30 indigenous tribes that called the Colorado River Basin home that had stewarded that water for thousands of years without screwing it up. And so they were not invited to the table. And then I'll ask the question, what if they had been? What if those 30 tribes had been invited in to sit at the table with those seven states? Would the Colorado River Compact uh, look the same today? If we had injected indigenous wisdom, indigenous values into the dividing up of that water system and how we use it and how we use it sustainably. And, and I, I think I'll let it, all the listeners answer that question. If we would have injected values into the system 100 years ago, would, be, would we be in the mess we're in today? And, and there's no way we would have created different policies that look different that valued everybody, including our non-human kinfolk, and that that would be different today. And you brought up a good point. How do we make this change? How do we how do we do that? What if we started teaching our children in kindergarten to look at the environment in this other way, mm -hmm. to look at it in the not a capitalistic way of, hey, you know that's that. Yeah, let's extract it. And you you can be a millionaire if, if you know, we're going to teach you how mm -hmm. and show you the process of how to do it. But it's going to take you devastating a certain portion of the environment to do it. But that's okay because that's our system. Money's more important. Yeah. The short-term profits always wins over the sake of uh, a long-term management of the environment. But what if we flipped that and started um, putting this indigenous value systems into our education system when they're smaller, mm -hmm. when our kids are starting school? Look, you can have that Western ways of learning, but let's incorporate this other part now. Mm -hmm. And let's maybe create a model that's a hybrid of, of recognizing the inherent value of the environment that we live in and how if we don't take care of it that it's you're not going to have an environment to to extract and deplete yeah and so i you know changing old people changing my parents' view changing even my view uh that's a stretch that's mm. that requires a lot of uh, soul searching and, and change. Mm -hmm. What if we started teaching that in the school systems? So it's just yeah. part of who we are. And that's how Native Americans taught their children. They used the land, they used the plants. I mean, my grandmother would sing me songs. She'd look at a plant out on Antelope Island and sing me this song. And she said, every plant has its own song. <laughs> and it's like, well, you know, you don't treat that plant, you treat it different than you would have if if they have their own songs, they have their own life. You're developing a relationship yes. with it. Yes, and it's, you're, you're correct. It, thank you for saying that. It's a relationship mm -hmm. of giving and taking, and Robin Wall Kimmer talks a lot about that, giving and taking, that reciprocity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I love when she talks about a gift economy and as you give something to somebody and, and there isn't a price or value on it, you only take as, as little as you need out of respect for the giver. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we don't live in that space anymore, but Native American people lived in that space. And I think it's a space we can interject into the, the school systems mm -hmm. and, and just start teaching a different way. And, and keep your other way too, but let's give them options. Yeah. Let's give them another way of looking at it. It's interesting because 
it, it really does sound like it's all about really embracing and bringing in this indigenous perspective and, and try and I, I like the idea of like kind of putting that into the schools and, and helping children see that perspective because I think in the end like it's going to be like oh well what do you like more uh, connecting with the land and playing outside or uh, just going to work in an office <laughs> you know like which one is going to you know which one are you prefer yeah. but it's I, I'm wondering what it will take to really bring in that indigenous perspective because I think that um, in some ways that that perspective even though it's probably it's it's a lot older than this capitalistic ex, uh, perspective it seems to be very radical and very contrary to what what we um, you know what we're taught and what we're what we're taught to value really um, I'm curious what you think um, what you think it'll take like uh, are is it just a matter of uh, really em emboldening and uh, and lifting up the voices of, of uh, indigenous nations, or is it um, is it going to have to be deeper or more than that? I think that's a that's a start and that's a help, and we can all we can all empower indigenous people to to hear their voices and by just little things that we do by supporting indigenous communities mm -hmm. when they have an event or anything else and advocating for them. But this last semester, I took a position at the University of Utah in their environmental humanities. What a cool degree. Yeah. I mean, think about environmental humanities. And I love how that sounds. Mm -hmm. It's a master's degree program at the University of Utah. They invited me this semester to be their practitioner in residency, which means I was there to teach workshops and mentor students and and give them an indigenous view of what the environment looks like and, and all kinds of different things, how we can interject indigenous values into academia. Mm -hmm. And so I did this for the whole semester. And at the end of the semester, the dean came to me and said, we need to hire you full time. Nice. That stuff needs to be taught in every level of academia. We need to change the way we do it. Be, And I said, well, your system, look, I've got a bachelor's degree. I would never get hired, though, as a college professor mm. because I don't have the PhD. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter how much knowledge you think I have. Academia is always going to look at me as inferior mm -hmm. because I don't. You know, I'm a square peg and you've got a round hole. Mm -hmm. And it, do it doesn't have anything to do with my knowledge level. But it has everything to do with the academy mm -hmm. and, and perpetuating this, you know, old way of looking at ownership of land and everything else. And so they are struggling. They're going to hire me full time, but they're struggling to find a way to justify my existence. Wow. They they know the value because yeah. they saw it for a whole semester. It's clear. And it, it's crystal clear to them. But what isn't clear to the the people that they have to get to sign off for the money is, you know, they're looking at it like, well, where did he get it? He doesn't have a mm -hmm. PhD. Well, <laughs> so that's the kind of thing I'm fighting today. But I'm going to fight this fight for a while now because I think we need to start in just infusing that uh, knowledge into the academy. Yeah. And, and by academy, I just mean our higher education system uh, because it just makes it more rounded. It makes it more valued and present. And those environmental humanities students got it. They really understood the value of what it meant to their education. But ma imagine if we can do that at an earlier age yeah. and start having people look at the environment differently from a different view. And uh, I think that's what's going to be needed for the whole systemic change to happen, though, mm -hmm. is we're going to have to start teaching it early so kids grow up thinking, huh, I know the, I know the song. I know that plant song. Yeah, that makes sense. And I and I uh, I just really like we thank you for sharing that because I think those those roadblocks that you're experiencing to like you know all of these people even the dean understanding that you know what you're talking about you have the knowledge and you have this uh, you have this credibility but that there's these weird roadblocks in the system and I think that that can at least force people to be like wait a second 
what are these actually measuring? Are these actually going to be producing what we want? Is it, you know, kind of things like that. I think that those kinds of roadblocks are almost like an opportunity to really build change. And, and I also want to say that I think my question was a little bit almost like pessimistic at first. And, and then just by you sharing that, it also reminded me that like, as me and people, uh, you know, maybe in my generation and stuff like that are seeing just the craziness in the world. I think one of the things we're really finding and understanding is like, you know, Native Americans, indigenous people, they, they really knew what they were doing. They knew how to have stewardship over the land and how to care for it. And we seem, our system seems to have ruined it in a little over 200 years. You know, we're bringing ourselves to the brink of annihilation. And so it kind of like, it, it just made me realize that maybe it's not like, yes, we definitely need to embolden indigenous voices. We need, we need, um, you know, we need you have to have a seat at the table, getting you into politics and everything, really. But um, I'm also just realizing that, you know, a lot of us um, who never really grew up with that knowledge and wisdom are kind of inherently becoming attracted to it. And uh, I think that actually brings me to one of my next questions, which uh, this is what um, uh, actually really made me want to go and talk to you in the first place was uh, when you were speaking at the Great Salt Lake Rally and you were telling the story of Crazy Horse's vision. It honestly brought me to tears and it's what like just compelled me to be like, I need to talk to this man. Um, can you share that story and um, and kind of uh, give us that background because I think it's it's got a lot of hope. Yeah, I mean, so Chief Crazy Horse, and I'm grateful they're doing a monument to him, mm. you know, back by the, the presidents at Mount Rushmore. They're honoring uh, somebody that I think was probably the greatest visionary of his time for sure and still is. Mm -hmm. uh, Crazy Horse, before he died, had this dream and his interpreter that was a good friend of his his whole life said, let me write this dream down. So Crazy Horse told him and he wrote this dream down. And what Crazy Horse saw, what I believe he saw was our day and time. Uh, he starts out by saying, upon suffering beyond suffering, the red nation shall rise again. And it will be a blessing to a sick world. And so I'm, you know, you start reading that and you're going, I think our world's pretty sick today. Mm -hmm. And uh, a world filled with selfishness and separations. And then he talks about seeing a time of seven generations when all humankind will come together again under the sacred tree of life. So you're, you're hearing him see the role that Native Americans can play in the future. And then he talks about um, there will be those among his people, the red man, who will have this knowledge of solving the issues of the day. They will carry with them this knowledge and understanding. And then he says something that uh, uh, is my favorite part. And he says, the young white ones will come to those of my people searching for this wisdom. And I'm thinking, we live in a pretty troubled world. We live in a world of selfishness and separations. And who is who is carrying this knowledge that will save us? The indigenous voices. They've had this knowledge for thousands of years and they will continue to have this knowledge because that's the way we live. And so he talks about us being this knowledge holder and then how the young white ones, the young white ones, not the white ones, mm -hmm. the young white ones will come to those of my people searching for this wisdom and asking for it. And then that's how we're going to save the world that we're in today. And, and it's just such a beautiful dream to me. And I, I tell everybody that listen, I think he was a prophet, a Native American prophet. And then I think I caused some discomfort to my church people when I say like Native American, many Native American prophets that lived before, but many Native American prophets who will come again mm -hmm. in these days. And, and I think that raises a few eyebrows in my church community. But I mean, in order, the, the view I have of the world today and where we're at, uh, I just think this 
indigenous wisdom is timely, it's important. And I think if we're going to have any kind of a future for our kids and our grandkids, that we're going to have to adopt this wisdom and way of looking at the world. Mm. And so I think he could see it and he talked about it. And now when we quote it today, it's like he could see our day and time clearly. And, but he, he has the answer. That's the cool thing. He has the answer to what we're going to need to do to change. And what, what, uh, what exactly was the answer? I think the answer is the red man has, the indigenous people have this knowledge to save the world. And the young, young white ones, the activists, the kids that are, know that this is their world to be saved or not saved are going to come and seek this and not only seek it, but embrace it mm -hmm. and then uh, use it to save the world. And by saving the world, that might be through education. Uh, right now it's through activism. Uh, they're getting their voices out there and they're saying, it's not okay that we do this. And we're gonna be here and we're gonna be loud about it and we're gonna hold you accountable every step of the way. And they're not going away. And it's only going to build and build and build until we really make systemic change that will allow them to have a future. Mm -hmm because I think we're, and we can't see it today because of all the water and other things, but I think in the next couple of years, it's gonna be crystal clear on, we should have made those changes yeah. before we actually have to really need to. We, we could have made it earlier and caused ourselves a little bit of less of a heartache, but yeah. I think that wisdom's there. I think the knowledge is there. We just gotta look at the problem through a different paradigm. I agree, and thank you for sharing that. Because uh, that uh, seriously, that that story, it really, really resonated with me, and it really does feel very prophetic. It just feels very timely for what we're dealing with now, and um, and I like I'm I'm seeing more and more people that are understanding. Like, yeah, indigenous people have this wisdom. They've been doing it all along. And our systems and structures and, and uh, powerhouses have just been suppressing their voices for too long. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to, to, see, to see the Red Nation rise again, you know, to see that. Me too. Yeah, to, to see, just to, I, I, I've just developed like a, like a full-blown like trust in any sort of um, like indigenous wisdom at this point, just because it, it all feels like, honestly very intuitive it yeah. feels like it just makes sense especially the the inherent value of the interconnectedness of all life mm. um especially like uh something that has been somewhat radical to talk to people about is is like hey did you know that we are nature that like we completely rely on everything in our environment and uh and that that seems to be a very um counterintuitive statement to our you know current paradigms yeah, because yeah. We're, we're definitely trying to see ourselves as completely separate. One of the things um, that I really loved hearing you talk about a lot is the need for systemic change. Um, and you've even called out like the capitalist uh, mindset and the capitalist uh, uh, structures and everything and, and how they are problematic. I think uh, that is that is something that I focus about or focus on a lot in this show is, is how uh, capitalism is one of the deepest roots of all of these problems. Um, in uh, previous conversations, I think it was at the Q&A and stuff like that, there was actually somebody there who explicitly asked, like, do we need to get rid of capitalism to save the world? Uh, I want to put you on the hotspot again for that and, and, uh, and see, just kind of, kind of flesh that out because I, I wonder if you'd also see it as, like, the root of the problem. It, yeah, I believe absolutely it's the root of the problem. Mm. Do I think it's going to go away? I, I don't think it's going to go away. Mm. So here's my hope. As an uh, indigenous elder who have been advocating for change, I, I've realized something that I live in this system that I didn't come up with, my people didn't come up with, but I think it's a system. I mean, think about it when, you know, when you're a young kid and your teacher tells you through this system, you can be anything you want. Mm -hmm. I mean, they sell it as freedom. If I work harder, mm -hmm. then I can, I can be a millionaire. I can have this and that. It's just up to me. I mean, that's what they sell us. Reality though, is not that. 
and the reality for a lot of indigenous and other marginalized communities that it'll never be that mm. no matter what and so there's a huge segment of that idea that idea of capitalistic ideals it doesn't conform to them mm. it doesn't allow them to succeed mm -hmm. because the it's not a level playing field no. and it never has been so I, you know i look at the problem the older i get the more i realize that this isn't going to go away but how can we minimize the effects mm. how can we maybe make some changes that will allow it to be a hybrid mm -hmm. and allow those who want to do their thing and to do their thing but get certainly way more people involved with doing the right thing for the environment mm. and and being successful in life even monetarily successful uh, you, you we can you can still do it both and so one thing you know last october i got invited by the university of copenhagen to go give a lecture there on the environment when i was there that was cool giving a 45 minute lecture at the major university for climate change it was awesome the cool thing though was the other eight nights they said well there's a catch we want to take you to dinner every night you're here a different professor with 10 of their grad students want to take you to dinner <laughs> it'll be a different conversation every night depending on what they study yeah so that was my reality but that was better than the lecture that was better yeah. than anything i could have done there in the country because i heard these other perspectives and finally on next to the last night i asked this young girl I said, look, I did some research before I came to Copenhagen. Why are you guys voted the happiest people in the world every year? And she said, we all have free health care. We all have a job and we all have a place to lay our head. We all have homes. She goes, it's not a 4,500 square foot home. It might be a 700 square foot apartment, but we all have a safe place to go and we don't worry about getting sick and not being able to be treated. Yeah, and as I walked the city, I didn't see any beggars. I didn't see any homeless people. I couldn't even find a gum wrapper on the street or in the subway. And I'm looking at this way of life and thinking, why wouldn't they be happy? Mm -hmm. And then this, this grad student she says you know you Americans fascinate me because you always think you're the best best economy best everything and she's saying it with a smile the whole time and I'm thinking okay I'm getting set up here <laughs> and she goes you're not the top in any of those categories <laughs> you know what you're the top in number one in the whole world and I said I I had to ask her and she said the number of people you lock up in prisons. Mm. I was gonna say military spending. Yeah, so yeah, we would probably, well, that or China, yeah. maybe or Russia. <laughs> so, you know, her saying that we lock people up, we're number one in the world of locking people up. And that, that hurt, that was like, and but she, and it caused me to reflect, how much do we need? I mean, would I be happy in a 1,000 square foot home or a building if it meant that every one of us had a home, mm -hmm. every one of us had a safe place to go every night? Would I, would I be okay with paying a little more taxes if it meant that everybody would have health care? Mm -hmm. Everybody. Somebody could walk up the street if they had a need and go to a hospital and be treated. Now, and you know, the, the other side will say, well, yeah, the, c the quality of care they're going to get in the hospital is not the same. So, you know, they're, we're always going to have the distractors. But would I be willing to pay just a little bit more for the community? Because really, that's what this is all about is a sense of community. And Native Americans understood what my grandmother taught me. 
that our communities are only as strong as the most vulnerable within that community. And so Native Americans had no concept of personal property. They didn't understand what that meant. And so all they did is looked at the needs of the community and said, there's a need over there. Let's all of us work together to take care of that need. We have obligations to the community. During the pandemic, one of the biggest things I heard coming out of, you know, during it is it became so polarized that I have individual rights. Mm. And I don't care if you're an anti-vaxxer or, you know, believe in it. I, it doesn't matter to me. What became crystal clear, though, to me is I have individual rights and you're not going to tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. The government's not telling me what to do. Well, I appeared on the Doug Wright Sunday morning edition show during the pandemic, and he wanted to know why 95% of our uh, tribal family had been vaccinated. And I said, because Western worldviews teach that you have rights. Nobody's telling you what to do. You can exercise that right the way you want. Indigenous worldviews teach us that we have obligations. Mm. Obligations to the past, present, and future. Obligations to our community to keep them safe. So what can I do with the best scientific knowledge we have at the time? And that can change. But what can I do when the science community tells me the best way to keep our community safe is to be vaccinated? That's why 95% of our people got vaccinated because that sense of community is not about you. It's not about your individual rights or concerns. It's about the strength of the community, keeping the community safe and keeping that sense of community intact and strong. And that's the way we do it. When we quit thinking about ourselves and think about what is the best option for all of our people. Mm -hmm. And that sense of community is, is I hope, is something that we can get back to. Yeah, I'm really glad you actually brought that up because that was another thing I really wanted to talk to you about. And um, I honestly love that that idea of like focusing on obligations as opposed to our rights, because I think when we take responsibility for our obligations and we fulfill those obligations, we sort of we end up with the rights that we're looking for in the first place. Exactly. And I was I'm reading this book called uh, The Dawn of Everything by David Graeber. And one of the things uh, he's like a cultural anthropologist and uh, he's trying to answer this question in the book of like, when did inequality start, which he realized is kind of an impossible question to answer. But what he's really looking at is um, a lot of history between um, Native Americans and uh, the French. And um, one of the things that they talk about a lot is how the French or the Native Americans were kind of like poking fun at the French, saying like, "How do you guys let like some like pinhead just like boss you around all the time, and you still have people starving all the you know and things like that?" It's like you you guys don't have any sense of values, and they're talking about how like we help somebody who's in need because they need it. And we know that we will be taken care of when we need it. And that just that entire perspective is, is I feel like really, really lost here in America. And I think it's directly what you're talking about, about a lack of community and a lack of community values. Um, so that's kind of my next big question is how do we really foster more community values? One of the things I'm really trying to do with this season of the show specifically is find ways that we can um, build community. Like what does it actually take? What does it look like? Yeah, there's a lot of answers to that. And what I like to tell people is turn off the national news. Mm. I mean, shut the noise off in your in your community and in your life. Mm -hmm. Because if I go turn on the news right now and watch that, my sense of hope diminishes to the point that it's like, what's the point? Are you serious? Yeah. Where, how, how can we even make a difference? Mm -hmm. But what I found, and especially where I live today, and, and not especially where I live today, because in every community I've lived in, go talk to your neighbor. Mm. Go do something for the guy across the street. If the, you see a need, take care of it in your own individual communities. So I think it comes down to really dialing it into our own small communities that we live in today 
if you're not doing things to help the community as a whole, start mm -hmm. when they when they have an activity promote you know do it if they have a neighborhood cleanup be out there and go help somebody if you don't have anything that really needs to be done go help somebody mm -hmm. that needs to be done but start serving in our own individual communities to, to try and make a difference locally because i think locally we really understand and maybe it's because of the culture of who we are, you know. The LDS Church had a huge impact on on taking care of your neighbor and, and, and that type of thing, setting up in wards, and everybody has a responsibility to take care of somebody. And so whether it comes from that or not, or whether you're LDS or not, I think the idea of serving in your individual community the best way you know how is the best way to to grow that community and grow strength in that community. Mm. And because that's the way the natives did. They looked at their own community that they resided in, saw a need, everybody rallied towards that need. That's how we began. And quit listening to the noise of the outside world. <laughs> yeah. That's their deal yeah but we can make a really wonderful community here in our in our home mm -hmm. uh, as we start serving one another and, and being better to each other yeah. and uh, focusing on more local than national because that is a dog that <laughs> quit hunting a long time ago yeah. <laughs> so but yeah. yeah that sense of community is such a big deal to native peoples and uh I think we're only better and stronger as a community as we uh, kind of take on some of those values. Yeah, I think uh, building resilient communities is kind of like the only way that we're going to be able to weather any type of fallouts from uh, climate change and everything like that, being able to have those networks and everything. Yeah, and it's it's about that, networks mm -hmm. and, and just being able to work together when we see a need. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we're going to solve it. Mm. It's interesting that you brought up uh, the LDS Church too, because um, you know a lot of uh, myself included and, and like my friends, um, we're like uh, ex Mormon. We're no longer LDS, mm -hmm. um, and I think what I've been finding as I've been talking to people and I've been like, guys, community is really important. Like, community is the answer. A lot of them, their only uh, experience of community was in the LDS Church, and they have like those negative associations. But on the flip side of that, I've even seen um, some people who really only stay in the LDS church because there's, there's such a strong sense of community. Like they're yeah. really good at doing that and caring for each other. And I think that um, it's worthwhile for anyone listening to like be a part of that community. Cause I think that that's, that's what's, that's what's important. You can, I think, work through the differences. I, I think so too. And look, I've been in, I've lived in a lot of different places and you know, the culture of the church is problematic. Mm -hmm. But what I found as I moved around to certain areas, it's way more problematic in some areas than others. Mm. And you know, the place I live today, I am pretty damn sure my political views don't line up with any of my neighbors, <laughs> like none. Yeah. You know, when I see their Trump 2024 flags flying, <laughs> and, and these are people I dearly love. Yeah. But we don't talk politics. And if we did, I'd be cordial and... You're capable of navigating I'm, that. I'm, I'm capable of that. But what I find is, man, when it snowed two feet and I'm down in this mountain crater valley, I have three guys fighting over who's going to plow my driveway out with their tractor, mm. who is there when I had open heart surgery a year and a half mm -hmm. ago. Uh, with meals and my lawn and everything else. And uh, that sense of community is stronger there than I've ever felt anywhere in my life. And, and trust me, we don't line up one degree politically, but they're there to uh, love each other mm -hmm. and help the community. And, and that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. uh, putting aside our differences. It's okay that we have differences all along. I can't imagine living in a world that we're all the same. Yeah. Can you imagine what that would look like and it's feel boring. like? I love the diversity that's there, even the diversity of thought. And, and while it can be contentious, it's only contentious if we allow it to be. Mm -hmm. And so if we allow it to not be, 
and to, to let it roll off and, and try to always take the high road in that, then then I think we have a really good chance to create a, a wonderful community of, of embracing and celebrating our differences. Mm. I think that's a wonderful lesson, especially um, because like, what's the point of letting like who, which, you know, super rich guy you want to be in office? What's the point of letting that get in the way of being there for each other when you truly need it? Exactly. I think that that's that's a really beautiful lesson. I I really thank you for sharing that. Let's, uh, so we'll, we'll kind of get close to ending here. Um, one of the things I'd love to uh, finish with is uh, I, I like to try to figure out what a common shared vision for humanity can be. I think that, you know, even when you're, uh, when we're talking about community and, um, and trying to embrace our differences, I think another thing to understand is that we always have more in common than we have different. And so I'm curious what you think, um, could be a vision for humanity that we can all share and move towards to build a better world. And thanks for asking that because to me, and I said it to somebody the other day, uh, a group I was talking to, I, I just, I go on a lot of hikes down where I live because I live in a mountain valley and it's easy to get in the mountains really quickly. But I look at it as, I, I told them to look at it and imagine their life as we're all at this big, beautiful valley of wildflowers. We all look different, but we all have our own individual uh, characteristics and traits. And and how beautiful that is that we don't all look the same. And as you look at a beautiful field of wildflowers in that way and celebrate the differences um, that we bring to the table, man, it just allows us to learn and grow in ways that we could never do if we were all the same. And so my my hope for humanity is that we can just start looking at people, seeing each other through each other's eyes, mm. because I think when that happens, the possibilities are endless. Uh, I think the differences that we all have can be the strengths that we all draw from each other. And uh, that's my hope for the world that I want to live in in the next 20 years. That's probably all I've got left. <laughs> Same. I hope we can build that world. Yeah, me too. Well, Darren, thank you so much for your time today. This has been an amazing conversation. I hope I can have you on again sometime. <laughs> anytime, anytime. <laughs> Perfect. Um, is there uh, anywhere that anyone should, um, you know, search to, you know, kind of find you and uh, maybe uh, get your book? that we can also talk about real fast. <laughs> yeah, well, my, my book is The Bear River Massacre of Shoshone History. It's it's on the big A word, Amazon, right? what's <laughs> not on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> but you can also message me and I'll sign it and send it to you for the same amount that they're going to charge you. <laughs> but you can follow me on my social medias. I'm on uh, Facebook and Twitter. I love Twitter, by the way, because my parents aren't on Twitter. Nice. And I, can, I, can, I can say things on Twitter that I would never say on any other platform. And then I'm on Instagram, and it's just under my name, Darren Perry, Perfect. and uh, the correct spelling, and you'll find me. And I don't share vacation photos, and I use all of my social media to highlight where I'm going to be speaking next. Mm-hmm. And I always do a Sunday thoughts and indigenous wisdom thoughts, Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes environmental, sometimes Mm -hmm. just how we can be better to each other. Mm -hmm. So I always try to leave messages of hope and love on all of my social media platforms. So I think it's worth taking a look at and, uh, and then message me and I'll be more than happy to send you a book. Perfect. Thanks so much, Darren. All right. Thank you. And that is the end of episode 29 of the kindness rebellion. Thank you so much, Darren, for having this conversation with me and sharing your wisdom. Uh, I really hope that all of our listeners can uh, take the lessons, take this indigenous wisdom and take it into our daily lives, assimilate it into our daily lives. And most importantly, find ways to give indigenous voices a seat at the table. They need to be included in these discussions, especially in regards to climate change, where we have been able to destroy the world, almost destroy the world, put it on the brink of annihilation in just 200 years. We need to remember that indigenous tribes were able to find balance with the earth for 
hundreds of thousands of years. Like we need to be able to take these lessons and be and remember them. And we need to uh, we need to remember that we are nature and that we are reliant on nature. Water is life. Um, so thank you so much, Darren, for this conversation. It it meant so much to me. And uh, thank you for everyone that has listened to this conversation. Please like, share, and subscribe. Comment. Let us know what you think. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much.